Hey everyone, it's Andy Kushner, host of The Wedding Biz, in which I conduct in-depth and revealing interviews of icons and those who I feel are the next generation icons of the weddings and event industry. And this is all to give you education and inspiration, and hopefully you will feel a better sense of empowerment. So I want to, first of all, greet all of the new listeners. I know that there are many new people tuning in from Ireland and all over Europe to listen to today's guest. So welcome to the show. Um, Be sure to check out the past catalog. It's pretty extensive now and almost anyone you can think of at a high level has been on the show. I'm very happy with it. And so I want to mention that if any of you missed last week's episode, it was with Bruce Russell, a wonderful planner designer based in London. He does events all over the globe. He's got a lot of recognition, including TV appearances, including his role as co-star of RTE Ireland's production of My Big Day, Home or Away, with Tara Fey. And today's guest is Tara Fey of Tara Fey Events, based in Dublin, Ireland. She has produced some of the most high-profile events and weddings in Ireland, throughout Europe, and in the USA and Caribbean. Tara has won several event industry awards, was previously voted Ireland's premier wedding planner by Social and Personal Magazine, and is a sought-after speaker at wedding events and lectures students in wedding and event planning. She also has had multiple appearances on both radio and TV, and has taken part in two documentaries on wedding planners for both RTE and the Lifestyle Channel. She's also been in numerous publications, and Tara is the co-star with Bruce Russell, who was on the show last week, of RTE Ireland's production of My Big Day, Home or Away. So enjoy my conversation with Tara Fay. Tara, it is so good to have the opportunity to interview you in person, given that you're from Ireland Mm. and I'm from Maryland. So this works out. We're here at Engage. We're here at Engage. And thank you so much for taking the time to interview me. Yeah, no, this is going to really be fun. And I interviewed your cohort, uh, Bruce Russell, from the TV show. We're going to get into that later. Yeah, great. Also, so so this is really fun to have both of you um, separately, first of all, on on this show. So, you know, being from... Ireland, it's so interesting. I know that yours was the first event company specializing in the creation of events and weddings for private individuals. But where did this start for you? Are You grew up in Ireland, didn't you? I grew up in Ireland, but I went to university in, in England. But in Ireland, when you were growing up as a child, was there anything as you were growing up that is related to what you're doing now? Was anything that connected to the passion for putting on events? I don't know. I mean, I always was sort of like arts and craftsy. And then I actually only realized afterwards when I looked back that when I was in school, in secondary school, so 16, mm-hmm. 17, I used to end up running all of the um, the school discos. The discos? Yeah. So for every, um, for <laughs> all of the local schools, I went to school in the center of Dublin. Yeah. Um, so like Friday, Saturday nights, I would um, every term, once a term, I would um, run the, the discos. That is so interesting. It's so interesting to me. There are so many people who have been on the show who did something in their childhood, even four, five, six years old, Mm. seven years old, that was related to the event industry. Now, it's just fascinating to me how some some of us grow up with that. But it's funny because I never thought of it as anything. It was just, you know, somebody needed to do it. And I was, so uh, so I did it. And and yet, dealing with the logistical elements too, were you just like a natural at that? The organization, the discipline? Well, you just sort of, it was a steep learning curve. Uh-huh. Like I remember one um, one nightclub where I found out that afternoon or something that we had to serve food from as part of the licensing laws. Yeah. So suddenly I had to sort of ring everybody I knew who had any ability in oh. the kitchen and get everybody cooking. <laughs> just right at the last <laughs> just minute. Just right at the last minute. Wow, it's so interesting. And that's a stress-filled situation and all of that. So what about school? Did you go to school for anything related to this? No, I did a degree in um, business and languages. So um, Mm -hmm. European business with French and Spanish, but in England. So it was, so I was there for four years. One of those years was spent in Spain Mm -hmm. and studying in Spain. And then after that, I lived in Spain for a while working. So you're fluent in, in Spanish and French? No, my French would be a still school French because the uh, main language was Spanish. But then I did French as a, I'm, I can get by in French. And then I learned a bit of Italian afterwards also. I, I mean, you know, it's so funny. Us Americans, all we know mostly is English. <laughs> and every, any European I've had on the show, you know, it's two, three, four, five, even six languages. Well, I think it's because Europe is so small mm-hmm. and also 
a strange thing happened, you know, in the, the 80s, we say the strange thing, or um, late 80s, early 90s, with the influx of budget airlines, which made oh. it much easier to get around Europe. Uh -huh. um, so we have, a, it's actually an Irish airline called Ryanair, but I mean, we said that they were possibly instrumental in the sort of the ease for Europeans traveling around Europe. And it also meant that a lot of different food cultures and different yeah. traditions started passing around Europe much faster than they would have normally. That, I, I've not heard that before. That's really interesting mm. to me. So then um, what did you, did you go to college, our, our equivalent of college? What did you go for? So that was, it was a, bi a business, oh, business and right. languages. Business but then languages. when I moved back after that, I moved back to Ireland and I was working as a, basically as a, what would be today called um, business development um, okay. for an individual who just was a serial investor in different companies. But I also then studied um, part-time. I did a master's in marketing and then I did mm. a master's in law. Wow. Yeah. What, 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 why law? Just, it seemed like an idea, good idea at the time. So I <laughs> used to go for two hours, five mornings a week oh my and gosh. four hours on a Saturday. Really? Mm, so I'd go to lectures wow. between seven and nine, yeah. then go into work. And then on a Saturday, I would do lectures from oh nine until God. one or two. I don't know how you did that. That's incredible. So what did you do with those degrees afterward? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just wanted to be a, a, a forever student. Yeah. But it was easier that time because I was working anyway as well. So it wasn't sort of as a bigger drain. Jeez, my father was a, a professor. Actually, he's a very big guy in, in anthropology. And I always thought that he always said to me, in a way, it's being a professional student doing that. So then when did you get start to get involved in events? And how did you do that? How did you get into it? So the company I was working for um, in Ireland at the time, I think it was 96, was an internet company. And mm -hmm. it was probably one of the first internet companies that we targeted um, the normal individual. So it wasn't selling to um, to companies. It was selling, we were getting, you know, selling to just the normal person who didn't yeah. have internet access. This was in the age of dial-up internet access. Oh, I remember. So we had, um, we were doing fully, bro um, you know, broadband enabled internet. The company was sold to a large telecoms company mm -hmm. and I had to make the decision. I didn't really want to stay with them. Yeah. Where was I going to go? I'd been with this other company for four years. Mm hmm I'd traveled all over the place, had a very, you know, interesting time working there. Um, and I had always been interested in events and weddings. And I ended up always being the person that had to put on the Christmas party, organize all of the sponsorship we were doing. And my father finally said to me, he said, you know, you need to stop talking about this and do something about it. Hmm. Uh, he said, what's the worst that can happen? He said, you make a mess of it, come back, do something else. He said, it's not the end of the world. So I interned with a company in Los Angeles, moved out, got rid of everything. Wow. Yeah, moved to Los really? Angeles How old for were you a few at the months. Time? Oh, I was 24. It so wasn't that's a big, yeah. somewhat young to just take off and do was something like, like 24, that. Was I 24, 25 maybe? Yeah, I just said, okay, this is it. I'm, I'm well, you know, what was it? What else I, were we going to do at that age? What else we were going to do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I actually had, how I got the job was I had called the concierge in Regent Beverly Wiltshire and I said, you know, I want to work in weddings. Come on. Um, I want you to recommend some companies for me to work with. Yeah. Um, and they said, okay, you know, here's the thing. You want to work in somewhere that will give you all around education, essentially. And um, so I worked for a lovely lady who's since passed away called Renee Simons, who was based in Tarzana in California. Mm. And she had a company called SNR Originals. Yeah. And she had been working in the events industry for 25 years. Mm. So she wow. kept saying to me, you're Experience. overqualified. Why do you want to come here? <laughs> um, but she was very generous with her time. Mm -hmm. Every day I sat with her, with her daughter, with somebody in the company, and I worked in within every area. So I worked in the flower room. I worked in the art department. I worked wow. in props. I worked in catering. So I really got a great education. And then I moved back um, to Dublin in 1997. Can I just ask for a moment, mm. though? Yeah, first of all, it's interesting to me the serendipity, the synchronicity of that particular person who took that phone call from you, yeah. right? And then to refer you to this this woman you're speaking about, mm -hmm. it's so interesting how things like that happen. Oh, I think everything is just is chance. I think so many things are chance and that you can be, um, you know, obviously there's a huge amount of hard work, but I yeah. think a lot of times, you know, you just have luck on your side. 
Really, you don't think that there's maybe not not that it's fate because I don't believe in fate. No, or I think it is and maybe fate as well because it's the certain people that you meet. I think it's kind how you interact. Right? Yeah, I think yeah. it's how you interact and with how them you as handle well. it. Of course. Because I would say that's it, right? right? A door to opportunity opens, but then you have to walk through. You have to walk through and you have to work at it. Yeah, there you go. Right. Because, you know, it would have been, I could have been there and I've had so many interns that, um, because I still always believe in giving interns a, oh, an opportunity. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you get some that maybe don't necessarily want to learn um, mm. or maybe they have a, a different thought process of how, you know, and they're, they're not open to to listening. Yes. Um, and I think you have to be open to listening and because you're never going to pick something up otherwise. So you were just a sponge when you were there. I uh, literally, I just, you know, <laughs> give me more things to do. I'd come in early, I'd stay late. They'd go, do you want to work weekend? I'll work every single weekend. I work every single hour you give me. Wow. Did you consider Tara staying in Los Angeles? I actually had a visa at the time, which mm, which I was see. I had a green card. Okay. Um, so in theory, I could have stayed. Yeah. Um, I was one of those lucky people in um, that got a, a lottery visa. Oh, yes. You know, I'm familiar with yeah. that. Sure. But I wanted to go back to Ireland. Mm. I had been going out with my husband now. With um, <laughs> We had been going out for about three or four years at the time. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know what? I, I Let me go back, see what happens. Yeah. Well, so what happened? So I went back and set up a company. No, okay, so so you decided I'm going to start my own yeah. company in the event, but 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 from again from what I understand, yours was the first one. It so, was the first. Yeah, there were two. There were there was what there's a an event company just starting at the same time, but yeah. doing corporate events. Apart from that, there were two sort of balloon decor companies at the time because mm. I went to meet them. And I said, you know, I'm just back. Here I am. This is what I'm doing. This is my name. I'm going to start doing weddings and private parties. And both of them independently said to me, but you had a job before. Can you go back to that? <laughs> and I said, well, why would I do that? Yeah. And they said, well, because this is never going to catch on. Nobody oh, is on. ever going to pay you to plan their wedding. That's wild. I have reminded both of them. <laughs> Did you? Oh, good. <laughs> I have reminded I was going to say, them. send them this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Recently. But, you know, this was at the time Ireland was going through a recession. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, Nobody's going to pay you. Even people in my own family were saying to me, you're doing what? Really? You know, that is ridiculous. You're never going to make any money. So how did you feel about all of that? I think I'm quite stubborn. Yeah. So if somebody says to me that that's not going to work, it yeah. makes me work. It's more motivating. Yeah, completely work 10 times harder. That is interesting. I'm getting the sense that must have been part of your personality from the beginning, growing up, that you had this kind of resilience I'm and quite persistence. Sort of single minded and focused. <laughs> well, but so it's, and you're, you're smiling. So I imagine you were excited by this challenge. Completely excited. See, right. Yeah. <laughs> it, it didn't slow you down at all. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh huh. Um, I, sort of, I potentially knew how to plan weddings. Yeah. So I realized very quickly that the market that I was going to have to go after was um, either expats coming back to Ireland to get married okay. or um, people from the US because there was that sort of romanticism about getting married in Ireland yeah. or people with an Irish connection. So that's what I started doing. I went around, um, I went to every media outlet I could find. Okay. I got everybody to introduce me to everybody else. And I just did interview after interview after interview. Wow. What, but what was the angle? I mean, I know that with the media, there's got to be an angle. Why would they interview you if this was something that didn't exist at the time? Because it was interesting and it was new. Ah, they thought okay. it was completely mad. Oh, oh, really? Because I think it's also the fact that possibly around that time that um, Father of the Bride movie had come out. Oh, that's per- How serendipitous is that? Exactly. So it was, they were going, a wedding planner, a wedding planner. But Irish people are never going to plan a wedding. Have anybody <laughs> plan a wedding? Why would they plan pay for somebody to plan their wedding. Um, and so I started off with a lot of US couples coming into Ireland, planning weddings mm-hmm. and just went from there. And I've always been, I've been incredibly lucky that apart from that sort of very first period um, where I was, it was a type of advertising, I would suppose that it, uh, the rest of it was word of mouth. Yes. That's really interesting. So what kind of response did you get from the media or, or rather from the public to that? Did people reach out to you? Or? People did start reaching out. And then I also met um, some 
very um, well-connected Irish people at the time who wanted to start doing private events for themselves. And they always had, it was at the time, maybe a caterer would have done an event. Um, But the caterer didn't want to look after all of the different aspects of an event. So maybe they had their assistant sending out the invitations. They had somebody else looking after a decor part of it. If it was a tent going up, you know, it was only the tent company and it was very rigid and there was nothing, nobody connecting all of the dots for them. Wow. So I started working for some... um, private individuals doing their their regular parties at um at their homes hmm. and through that i again it was serendipity yeah. or whatever you call it they introduced me to other other people and introduced me to more people and it just it sort of took off from there do you remember your very first event that you did absolutely what was that like it was for 40 people um it was somebody i knew so they were sort of doing me a favor oh, okay yeah but, but still, it was still, still yeah but still I was watching every single thing. And it's funny because that, I think that experience Mm -hmm. of watching everything, because I was watching to try and learn. But watching what exactly? I was watching how the staff were moving. I was watching where the guests were going. I was watching how the guests interacted with the staff and vice versa. Mm -hmm. I was watching how the guests interacted with each other, how they changed their position, their body language when music was playing, how they reacted to the food and drink. And I think it was that very first experience. I've always been that way. I will still always walk around a room constantly watching. I love that you're looking at body language and... and You're looking at everything because you know that if somebody pulls a coat or a jacket around them, it's maybe the air conditioning or the temperature Ah. is, is, you know, if somebody is playing with their food, maybe the weights, the service staff haven't realized that that person doesn't like what they're eating. You know, if somebody isn't touching a drink or something, maybe it's that they don't like it. So, you know, you always go and offer and say, is everything okay here? Would you like me to get somebody else to, you know, to, to help you with and change out your order? Is this something that you learned when you were in L.A. or is this just I think intuitive it was for you? You just observe. You I love to observe. Just observing, yeah. yeah. But also, when I was in England in college, all the way through, I had lots of part-time jobs, as every student does. So yeah. I worked in, in hotels. I worked in restaurants. I worked in bars. I worked in Harrods in the designer room. So you learn levels of service, I think, and you learn how people expect certain things. Yes. But it's also, you. it's making people happy. That yeah. by creating a level of service, that that's the experience they're going to remember. Mm. I love how you're getting into the depth of such detail, mm. which is really probably what differentiates people in the industry from others. Well, I, I think, you know, it's what we're doing is we're not saving lives. <laughs> you know, it's not brain surgery. Yes, we are. We are. We are create, <laughs> but we're creating beautiful events. But we're creating experiences for people. Yeah. I know sometimes we do think like we're saving lives, but I think sometimes we're saving people's, you know, their their mind, or sometimes we're saving, you know, their personality or their enjoyment <laughs> of an evening. Yeah. Um, and unless you can sort of tune into that, I mean, anybody can create an event that just, you know, you tick boxes. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I'm thinking right now, so many people have talked about addressing the five senses that we all have, addressing mm-hmm. each sense. And the way you're talking about the detail and observing, it that is exactly what you're really playing to, is the senses of it, the visual, the sound, the taste, Completely. The, all of this. But and every person in that room will, will judge each thing separately. Mm-hmm. One of my colleagues who works with me, she'll always say that the things that people are going to remember at the end of the night, especially in Ireland, because we go very late on all of our parties and weddings, they're going to remember where their coat was. That they, somebody, (laughs) this is, if it goes wrong, that's what they're going to remember if they can't get home. That is interesting. Mm. Wow, that is Something so simple. Yeah, no, but that makes sense. I mean, that could just uh, kind of spoil the the feeling at the end. The experience from when they walk in Mm -hmm. from that very first touch point until they leave at the end of the night. Yes. So I will always stay until the end of an event. Even if I like, I'll always have a team there as well, Mm -hmm. but I will always be because unless, unless, you know, unless a client, you're earning your money for if something goes wrong. Not when Uh everything goes right. Yes. No, no, no. I love that. Well, let's talk about the beginning. You said from the moment Hmm. it starts. On your website, it says the decor and design of your event space has the ability to instantly impact the guests. It needs to be executed with great taste and attention to detail to succeed in making the right impression. Again, decor and design, the ability to instantly impact the guests. Hmm. Can you tell me more about that? Everybody is, every guest is different or every client is different. So at the very beginning, when I'm sitting with somebody especially if it's a wedding client, for example. Yeah. I think we sometimes forget 
because we do so many events and we do so many weddings that it's their first time they're yes. doing this. Yes. And we always have to remember, I think all of us within the industry, that anybody that we're meeting for the very first time, it's mm-hmm. it's their first time meeting us. It's their first time p- potentially discussing their wedding. It's their first time discussing their event. And it's up to us to listen to what they want mm-hmm. as opposed to saying, well, here's what I'm going to do. Yes. So I will always spend a lot of time listening to people and going, tell me what you want. Tell me what you think you want. What type of event do you want to create? How do you want to feel? How do you want your guests to feel afterwards? Mm. And that is all, then the decor and all of that comes from that. From that. So it sounds like it's still all related. You're, the way you focus on the detail, I imagine you're also watching their body language, all of it, while you're asking the question, while they're speaking. It's everything, but it's also about listening to them because yeah. I think as well that it's every event should be unique to that couple or that person or that group of people, whoever mm-hmm. you're creating your event for. Mm-hmm. So unless you've listened to them, you're not going to know what they want. Yes. Because I can... Of course, I could have, you know, party A, party B, party C. Right. And going, which one do you want? Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah, pick yeah, your yeah. checklist. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that doesn't help anybody. You know, it's not. They're spending a lot of money. As I said to, to my couples, you know, this is probably one of the biggest investments you're going to make in your life. But you don't want to spend the rest of your life regretting something that you've paid for. Mm. Can you think, maybe walk me through a story of perhaps one of the, a favorite event that you've uh, planned and designed in terms of from the beginning meeting with the couple and how you were able to walk through that? I'd had one just recently and it was just, it's, it's funny because um, the girl actually said that she was going to have to marry her sister off just so that she could go through the whole process again <laughs> and that her sister wanted to as well. It was, they were very nervous about getting married. They didn't like being center of attention. They were oh. very nervous about the event. Yes, about the whole yes. the stress of it, you know, that they knew they wanted to have a wedding. They knew they had to do certain things. And I said, no, hang on a minute, back up here. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do any of these things. What do you want? What do you, what do you want from your wedding? What are the main parts that you want to keep in? How do you want to feel? Mm-hmm. And we designed everything around them. So it was very different. You know, it wasn't the standard where there was the band, the DJ, you know, like in an Irish wedding, it goes on all night. Yes. So this one did go on all night, but we changed it around so that they were, it was like a dinner party and we had music all the way through dinner, but then we moved them and we had a DJ and then we had um, a sing song. That's a sing song where people sing sing along? Where people sing along. And how does, how did that go? That always works amazingly this is well in Ireland. So we had um, like a karaoke, or no, in a we sense? had a, um, a piano player yeah. and um, and um, guitarist, and he's a, a very famous um, Irish singer. Okay, um, so he sat with everybody, played all of the tunes. Then people started doing requests. People started singing with him, wow. and that went on. So it went on until four in the morning. Oh my god, this sounds like a movie. But this was what they. It was so. It was for them. It yeah. worked for them. Hmm. Had you done that before, a sing-along? We've done different elements of it, but yeah. not in this particular order. That is really fascinating. Or I had another um, couple who were just so, t- she again was terrified of getting married. She just, the attention. So we um, rented a beautiful venue in Ireland called Ballyfin House, which is just divine. And we only had 50 people, but we made like four days. So we had, we, we as I said, we drip fed the information to her. So yeah. she, it was never, so the wedding was on day three. Yeah. So she was comfortable and happy enough that, by then. Tara, to that get. is amazing. Yeah. But it, it was, she was nervous about getting married. So we were, mm. I was going, well, what's going to make you not be nervous about it? These huh. are your friends and family. Yeah. Why don't we get, you know, you spend two or three days with them beforehand and we do the wedding towards the end and uh, she's going, oh, I love it. Yeah, I, I love it. I, I think that's absolutely brilliant. You know, you were talking earlier about uh, the sing-along, and, mm. and it's interesting, in your website, you specifically say, and not a lot of, of planners have this in their site, you, you chose, you said, entertainment is a powerful component of today's events. Entertainment is central to creating a superb atmosphere, thus it ulti- ultimately determines whether or not you have a successful event. Mm-hmm. So, entertainment has always been something really important to you. It's incredibly important, and it, especially if 
I mean, I work with a lot of um, Irish clients all over the world. So okay. they will bring me with them to do their events in whatever country. But I also then work with people, you know, coming into a destination, coming into Ireland. And the reason they're coming to Ireland is for that Irish experience. Ah. So they want the sense of Irishness. They want mm. the party. They want, as we say in inverted commas, the crack. Say the, that again? The crack. It's okay. the fun. It's the sort of the the feeling of, you know, everything is is relaxed and just fun and every uh, and it's the feeling of family and and emotions and everything wrapped up together yes um we have a it, there's an expression in irish called mehel which is it's a community spirit and with a wedding everybody in the the area mm-hmm. will will come together oh, and community. create yeah and, the, everybody everybody loves a wedding in ireland everybody loves a wedding huh. like if it's in a local church yes the locals will come and watch the wedding no kidding. oh yeah always they love it that is <laughs> i've never heard of this before yeah they love i mean they love a good wedding they love watching they love seeing they love seeing people and you know people will say to me what time is the bride coming out i want to see her oh wow that is really, and, and obviously though the party, are the parties in Ireland, is it similar, like from my experience, average of 150, 200 guests, is that similar? It's similar as well, yeah. So it would be 150 going up to sort of, you know, depending on what part of the country that people are coming, having the wedding, mm-hmm. they can go up to three, 400 people also. What are some of the challenges that you've had to manage, that you've had to work with? I mean, weather is always an issue. Um, in Ireland. So I always say to them, look, we're planning for a rain. Um, <laughs> okay. And if it's dry, it's great. Um, when we've been overseas, you know, things like shipments not arriving, everything like that. It's it's not, as my husband says, not what life throws at you. It's how you deal with oh, it. Oh, absolutely. And that's what I'm saying. You know, as a planner, we're being paid for the things that go wrong. Mm, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've had generators break down. We've had, you know, leaks and tents. There's always something. But as long as it happens with enough notice, we can solve it. Mm. Um, and there's always a solution to something. It's just about, well, I'll never it. tell the client. Like the yeah. wedding that I told you about where we had, just where we had the sing song. And um, my main musicians for, um, for during drinks reception and dinner, their flight from London was cancelled. Okay. So, and I got a call from the agent going, look, the flight's been cancelled. We're trying to get them onto the next flight, but their bags may not make it. And I said, okay, look, don't worry about it. What do they need to wear? <laughs> okay. um, I called my transport company. I said, you're going to have to make a stop at, um, at a oh store on the way gosh. so that they can go shopping. Yeah. I said, this is the amount of time. I called the, um, the audio company and I said, push back the sound check time. We're going to have to figure it out. Went to my church musicians and I said, can you give me an extra hour? And Phil. Okay. And they said, well, hold on, let's see what music we've got with us. Mm -hmm. But it worked out. And I told the bride that night. Yeah. You know, it's interesting while you're saying this, I'm trying to picture myself in that moment. There is, we do have to emotionally, mentally put ourselves in a place where we don't act out the anxiety, right? And stay calm for everyone around us. And just believe that we're going to figure out a solution. I think that relaxes us to be able to do it. I mean, if somebody sees you running across a room or yes. sort of like panicking, well, then it's game over. You know, if the planner <laughs> is looking stressed or flustered, oh yeah, you know, that's n- how's that going to be comfortable for the bride and groom or the guests or anybody? They're well, going, or, oh my God, is the, is the building burning down? Or your team. <laughs> yeah, no, completely. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I know we set the tone, you know, for our teams. In my early days, in my music company, in my early days, I remember going through some stressful situations where I was, like you just said, don't run across the room. I would walk very fast. My gait would be completely Mm -hmm. different. My expression on my face. I wore my emotions on my sleeve. And I I started to understand how, I mean, let alone a client potentially seeing that, which I hope never happened, but just the band alone, they would see it and they would start acting differently. And and I learned quickly. Because they start getting, they get panicked. Yeah. So we have to somehow just keep it inside. Are you feeling the panic inside and you're just managing it? Or do you have this stoic kind of a... It's it's funny. One of my teams says to me that when I go into the... When I start talking in a in a very oh, measured tone and low <laughs> voice that they know that they said when she gets scary, calm, yeah. we're all in trouble. Is this the same with your kids? They must <laughs> yeah, be the they same know, thing. Yeah, they do. <laughs> when you They're get like that, really calm, oh, mother... Yeah. Um, but I think it's as well, even the language that we use. I remember one of my um, production managers laughs at me. He said, because on, he came over on the radio and he says, we've got an issue with such and such. And I went back to him and I said, please don't ever use that word again. Oh, I like that. I like that. Because not everybody is wearing an earpiece. 
Um, and it can mm. come across on if somebody has their radio turned up. Yes. Anybody around can hear it. Now, there's never an issue. <laughs> never an issue. You know, it can, you can go, what's your location instead and come and tell me in person. Yeah, no, I like that. It's really good to pay attention to that. You know, what about also running the business aspect of what you're doing? Um, that's a whole nother skill set. And how, how do you approach that? Yeah, I mean, I have made every mistake in the book. Yeah. Every single mistake that there is to be made, I have made it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I will still continue to make mistakes. Mm. But I think it is recognizing your strengths and weaknesses and pulling in help as and when you it's needed. Yes. I mean, just because I did law doesn't mean that I can write a contract. Right, right. I can potentially read one, mm-hmm. but I'd still get somebody else to look at it. You know, I am not an accountant, so I need somebody to help me with that. That's right. But still, for you to learn all of that, figure it out, where did that come from for you? Was it just by doing? I think it's just by doing and making those mistakes. Mm. Um, and sometimes they're really expensive mistakes. Yeah, I've been, oh, I've been through that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and sure. I think it's by making expensive mistakes um, that you're going to learn. Yeah. And I think that's where it's it's really important as well when I ever I have an intern with me and I go, you know, anything you want to change with any process, mm-hmm. give me a reason why we're going to change it. Yes. Because I'm open to whatever. If you want to change the way that something is done, if you want to change the way a call is logged, the way an email is answered, mm. um, tell me. And let's look at why it would work. Mm -hmm. But you need to come up with a good reason as to why. I'm not going to do it just because you think it's a good idea. Yeah. No, I like that. You know, also just in terms of getting clients, um, your site, I believe, or an interview said up to 70% of your parties come from referrals from clients and guests at the events. Yeah, Really important. And if somebody phones me or um, it goes as a referral through, by the time I get to meet somebody, they've already been, um, have gone through sort of like, Joe, who um, works me, so she'll have, you know, pre-qualified them before they even get to me. And once I get to either speak with them on the phone or do Skype with them, depending on what country they're in, or physically meet with them, I'll go, where did you hear about me? Were you at one of my weddings? Mm -hmm. Or do you know somebody? And I can link backwards. Yes. Because that will tell me what they're expecting or what they're not expecting. Okay. All right. And I go, well, do you want, and it's also as well, when I meet somebody, they go, well, you know, like what, even if they don't know what budget they're dealing with, Mm -hmm. I go, well, do you want a Ford Fiesta or do you want an S-Class Merc? Mm. So what type of event? And that just gives me an idea, you know, and if you put it in a car context to people, yes, you know, do you want to spend, you know, 500,000 euro or is your wedding for a hundred thousand? Because if it's less than that, you know, you need to go and speak to somebody else. Yes. Yes. No, I love though coming up with an analogy so that people can really understand so that they're you're speaking the same language. You know, it, it helps them. And it was actually a father of a bride said that to me a number of years ago. He said, so what am I getting for that? He said, am I getting a, am I getting a Ford Fiesta oh, or am I getting an S-Class Mark? And I said, a, well, you're sort of getting somewhere in between. He yeah. said, that's fine. I'm happy with that. Right. But that made it clear for him. Yeah. That's really, that's really fun. You know, also, I know that in Ireland, you also now, there's an opportunity and I, maybe this is one of the first times to hire specialty linens, chair covers, table accessories for people's weddings and events. When did you start that? That what came from necessity because at the beginning, it's funny, I remember again going to the two companies that were doing sort of decor and balloons and that and saying, you know, about chair covers. Um, and they said, why would people cover chairs? <laughs> um, and I said, well, I have 200 of them. I, I brought them with me. Yeah. And they, you know, so I don't use chair covers anymore. But at the time mm-hmm. it was, you know, you needed to have a stock of them and nobody else had them. Uh-huh. And I needed linen that wasn't just plain white linen yes, um, or a poly mix or something like that. Mm. So I started buying linen and then using it for my events. And the same with candle holders because the florist didn't have them. I don't do it as much anymore. I'm trying to get rid of it all. Oh, you are? Um, okay. Because it's just the, you know, the upkeep on it and the turnaround. Yeah, the and it's not what I do. The cost is really And it's high. not what I do. Yeah. But at the time, I... It, it was out of necessity. Hmm. Um, but also I think as well that I have, I have such a goldfish brain okay. that I don't like doing the same thing again. I love that. So once I've used it. Right. You don't want to. I don't necessarily want to use it again, but I know other people will. Oh, uh, got you. So I now give it out with to a higher company and they'll, mm-hmm. they 
they cross hired from me and send it out to other people. I see. So, um, you know, when we started, I mentioned that I'd interviewed Bruce, you know, mm-hmm. Bruce Russell, yeah. your, your television husband. Yes. Uh, as you said, can you tell me about, about that show? Um, I know it's RTE's flagship lifestyle show, My Big Day, Home or Away, which is now into its second season, I mm-hmm. believe. How did you come to, uh, to get into that and how's it going for you? I actually was um, approached a few years ago by a producer in the network asking me, would I be interested in talking to them about or screen testing for them? And I, so I went and I met them and I said, um, I would. Mm-hmm. I said, but it depends on a number of factors. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't devalue my individual brand. I have to be able to work with somebody as the co-presenter who is yeah. of a level with me, but also who I get on with. Yes. Um, yes. And it has to be a premium product that we're, we're, you know, even if it is a very low budget that we're dealing with for, yes. for weddings, mm-hmm. um, we can't be seen to be going, just doing a, an event that's different to what we would normally do for our normal clients. Hmm. So how then did Bruce come into it? So I called Bruce because I had met Bruce at a conference a few years before. Yes. Um, and I said, yeah. so I've been approached. Are you interested? And he said, sure. He said, let's go and talk to them. Mm. You know, you said you met him at an event, at a conference. Mm. Networking, right? You just don't know where it's going to lead. You just, I mean, it's its interesting. I was talking to you earlier about Christina Matucci, who's a very close friend of mine. And on the show. Yeah, yeah, she's great fantastic. Episode. Um, and I met Christina and David. David Beam. Yeah. And David Beam in a taxi from Athens Airport. Come on. Having nothing to do with... I or- never met them before. Okay. Um, and it was my first international conference. I think it's about maybe six, seven years ago now. Yeah. Um, and I think that was probably one of the single most important co- um, conversations I've had. And why is that? Because they introduced me to so many other people that have had such an impact mm. and such a change on not only the way I do business, mm-hmm. but on my business itself. Wow, that is fantastic. Because the the people that they then introduced me to yes. led to so many other different experiences, but also um, different collaborations as well. You know, uh, Ed Libby, you know, yes. the big planner, yeah. speaks at Engage also. I heard him speak, it was about a year and a half ago, and, and you know, he now has an enormous position with MGM and, yes. you know, in Vegas and the floral design at Bellagio and, and other uh, casinos, MGM in DC. And he was talking about how it was because of this conference and coming back, you know, kind of year after year, that that is how he was able to get that position, which completely changed his life. I, I completely agree with it. And I know Ed as well. And I, I, Ed has been over in Ireland with us as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and But it was David and Christina introduced me to Bruce oh, Russell. Here we go. Yeah. So it's that serendipity. That's um, fantastic. And so many, they've introduced me to so many other people. Hmm. And you're speaking at Engage this yes, week. Yes, with and, Bruce. Yes, and you're going to be talking about... The reality of reality television. <laughs> the reality of reality television. Yeah, and what basically, what are you going to, what, what, what are you going to be talking about? What's the premise? The premise is that, you know, it's not all glamorous. It is hard work. Mm. But I think it's also the main thing, the main part of it is trust. Yes. That you have to trust what you do yourself. Yes. So even if somebody is pushing you, to say something like our producer or director would maybe push us to say something in a particular way. Mm-hmm. It's to have the confidence yourself to know, no. Yeah, that's a you, big one. It's to trust the director and the whole team as well, that they have your best interests at heart. Yeah. But it's also to trust your co-host because we have each other's backs. That's right. Yeah. And it goes back to as well that we're asking clients to trust us. Uh, that's a really good point. They want. Yeah. They have to trust us they with do. a hugely important part of their life. Yes, and a huge chunk of money as well. <laughs> that, well, yes, that goes without saying. You know, I want to mention too for people uh, listening that you have a YouTube channel, I believe, where people can yes. see because it yeah. is out of Ireland, yeah. and so we'll, we'll put link in the show notes yeah. to that. So it's Bruce and Tara live. Yes, Bruce and Tara live. You know, also Tara, I know that you have, uh, you're married, you have three children. Mm-hmm. You know, as a, I, I've said this on the show before, um, you know, I have a daughter and as a father, it was really important for me to be present for her. However, and this was when I was even, I'd started the business when I had a job in the corporate world and, um, and, and she was there when I was making the switch to full time. And I really wanted to be present for her. Though I do know 
that as important as it is to me as a father, for the mother, it is still, it's, it's way more complicated. There's a lot more to it. How have, how did you approach raising your, having children, raising children while you were uh, building your business? You know, it's interesting because I think, you know, having it all is, is silly because you just can't do it. There has to be something that gives all, all, every day. And you just have to make the decision. Um, I think it was uh, Mark Zuckerberg's sister actually spoke about the fact that you can't, if you pick sort of five or six things that are important in your life, Uh and if you get three of them done each day, yeah. That's a good thing. So, you know, like if it's family, work, um, you know, relationships, children, something, you know, try and hit three of those in a day. No, I like that. But you're never going to be able to do everything. You can't be everything to everybody because you'll just be exhausted. And, you know, I, I tried, but things give way. So like when I'm at home, I am at home. I'm present with you're them. Fully well, there. I like to think I am. I'm sure they'd have different <laughs> opinions of it. Right. But when you're with a client, you're a hundred percent with them. And yes. you know, don't beat yourself up about it because you know the guilt that everybody puts on each other. Mm. Um, and I think it's the guilt even as planners or even as mothers or women we put on ourselves. Yes. Is silly because all that you're doing is you're pulling yourself down and you're gonna make yourself sick. Mm. Um, and it's about having time. Mm-hmm. Give yourself time and don't make excuses for it. I used to make excuses. Oh, I'm going away for a weekend. I don't make excuses anymore. Just own it. And, Just and, and own I think it. our children also learn about that, that we are really dedicated to what we do. Huge. We're, we're dedicated to them, but also we have passions. And so that it's modeling it for them. My um, 12-year-old is the middle one. And um, both my daughters, all my children actually code. And um, the two younger ones met the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, so Harry and Meghan, oh, last year. Okay. And they were showing them their coding projects. And <laughs> one of them was photographed and on like on in Hello magazine on all over like net, t- TV networks all over Europe. But when she was asked, you know, do you want to be a coder when you grow up? You know, now that you've met all of the royalty and everything like that. And she's met lots of different people. And she said, no, I want to be a wedding planner. Oh, come on. Really? Yeah. How do you feel about that? So I'm going, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know what you're getting but into? But it's interesting, isn't it? How it is. people see, or children see what you do. Mm-hmm. But I mean, both my parents worked and it's sort of like that work ethic. Yes. That yeah. it's, you know, I think it's like my father started work at five in the morning. He had his own his own company, but he he worked very very hard all of the time. Yes, well, and I'm thinking growing up, all we know is what we experience. We don't know anything else. So he modeled that for you, being dedicated. There's I, interestingly, I've a sideline. So bizarrely, I I've ended up doing over the last number of years quite a number of funerals. Hmm. Randomly, yes, I'm hearing there that there are events associated with funerals. Yeah, mm. um, and I think it's it's a privilege to be asked mm. to do them because I am asked by the people themselves to do their funerals. What? Where I've worked Wait, with Tara, them. I'm th- I'm imagining it's the family and no, they contact no. you. It's like they will have asked me. Like the first one that I ever did oh was a, 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 a gentleman who I'd worked with for a number of years doing his um, all of his family events, and he was sick. And he asked. I remember going and like looking to where it was going to be a very very large event because it was he was very well known public figure. And I said, "Does he know I'm here?" And they said, "He asked for you to be here." Wow. But I remember he always had a phrase that he said, it's better to wear away than rust away. <laughs> wow. Wow. And he was terminal at the time, you're he saying? He was terminal. But I thought, you know, like, what a lovely what privilege. An honor. I was going to say that it's is such privilege. an honor. Yeah. Um, and and it, it's funny because it's one of those things that people now know and they'll go, oh, but hold on, she did such and such a funeral. Ask her, can she do it? But so now it is the families that ask me. That is really fascinating. Mm. Wow. So what are you thinking about in terms of like the next five years or so for your own career with this? Where do you see yourself? Ooh, there's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a tough one? Did I stump no, you? No, not really. I mean, I th- it's an interesting question. I think, you know, I love what I'm doing. I would say to people that I think wedding planning or working in the events industry anyway is a vocation. It's not a job. Yes. I think you have to choose to do it mm-hmm. um, because it is so all encompassing. Um mm. I mean, I really want to do in more interesting projects in interesting places. Yes. So I love when I get a country that I've never been to and you're sort of learning super fast oh, how yeah. to do something because, and you're sort of like learning on the hoof because you're, you, as, as you go along, but it pushes you. 
because if we have to do the same thing all over again mm -hmm. every single day or every single year, we're going to stagnate. Yeah. And even as an industry, yes. I think it's about looking at the new new things and embracing new technology and looking to the younger people within the industry as well and go, okay, what have you got to say? Mm. You know, how are you going to change change the world? Because we always think when we're in our 20s, we're going to change the oh, world. Yes, we do. <laughs> but I think now we have to listen to them and mm. go, you know, how are you going to change it? Mm. What are you going to do to make my life easier? <laughs> mm. Well, I have one more question for you. Yeah. I'm going to see if I can stump you on this okay. one. Okay. <laughs> How do you view success for you personally? I view success in when I can go home at the end of the day going, that was a good day's work. Hmm. And I can close the door, uh -huh. switch off, cook dinner, yeah. and watch TV and shout at my kids going, have you done your homework? <laughs> and, you know, if, please God, I get to do that for the next number hmm. of years, that is a good day and that is success. You know, happy clients yes. and a happy family. Yeah. Well, I can really resonate with that. Thank you so much, Tara, yeah, for being you. on the show. It's been a blast. Great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Tara Fay. And be sure to check out the website of Tara Fay. There are two. First, tarafay.ie. That's tarafay.ie. Or at her company website, which is xena-productions.com. That's xena-productions.com. Her social media handles is Tara Fay Events. You can find all of this in the show notes at our website of theweddingbiz.com. And please be sure to share this episode with your friends and colleagues so that people all over the world can find the show. Would love if you did that. And don't forget to listen to our follow-on segment coming up on Wednesday. It happens each week. It's called The Next Level, in which I have a guest co-host. And together we tease out some of the highlights of the interview to help bring up some tips and advice for you to use to apply to your own business in order to grow and thrive. And this week's guest co-host is going to be Bruce Russell, Tara's co-star of RTE Ireland's production of My Big Day, Home or Away. So be sure to tune into that. I want to mention that next week's episode is going to be with Jose Villa. It's part one. It was recorded a couple of years ago. Jose is a, as I'm sure you all know, an absolute phenomenal photographer who's uh, known throughout the world. A week later, I'm going to then have part two. So two very exciting episodes with Jose Villa. And I want to thank our sponsor, Kushner Entertainment. If you want to get some great music that not only has just the best talented singers and musicians, but also how they work with the crowd and how the team behind them who supports them works with our clients and party planners, be sure to check out KushnerEntertainment.com. And we'll catch you next week on The Wedding Days. <laughs> <laughs>